welcome everybody to uh, the last uh, Vamos uh, seminar of the year. Uh, and just, we will be uh, taking a break after this and, and restarting the seminar sometime uh, in late January, most likely January 29th, but uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, and for our grand finale, it couldn't be a greater pleasure for me to welcome Rob Shulkoff, uh, to who will deliver uh, the Vamos seminar. Uh, Rob is graduate of Princeton and received his PhD from Caltech and, and joined the faculty at Yale University uh, in 1998. Um, I was looking at his Wikipedia page. It says his main interests are quantum transport, single electron devices and charge dynamics in nanostructure. So you might ask- A little why, old. <laughs> yeah. why, why is Rob giving the Vamos seminar? Well, of course, it's because Rob is a real pioneer in the field of circuit QED, having really invented the field together with Steve Gervin and Michelle Deveray, inventing the Transmon, uh, which uh, is the foundation of superconducting super quantum computing. And circuit QED is an amazing realization of what me as a quantum optician knew as cavity QED blows us away what can be done. And it's beautiful work. We're really excited to have you here, Rob. So take it away. Okay. Thanks very much, Ivan. So uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and it's nice to see uh, some old friends uh, and to get together at least virtually in this uh, during these unusual times. So um, yeah, I thought what I would do today is try and give a uh, a little update on uh, what some of the work we're doing at Yale in this whole circuit QED area is about, uh, specifically some of the fun we're having uh, with quantum error correction as really an experimental discipline. So uh, are we on the second slide? Is it working? Good. So, um, you know, it's a very exciting time in uh, quantum information and, uh, uh, and science and uh, all of that. So. There's a lot of uh, technology development going on uh, and a lot of excitement about uh, applications coming in the near future on uh, many of these concepts. But I think I wanna emphasize that there's still a lot of science left to do. Uh, we're not all the way there yet in terms of just being able to build uh, systems and uh, quantum computers. And in particular, you know, one of the really interesting topics in quantum information is can you make logical qubits? Can you do error correction uh, and have that actually translate into uh, the real world and into eventually making maybe a fault tolerant computer? But in the meantime, the ideas of how can you craft it, a system such that engineered dissipation or the right series of measurements actually helps to stabilize uh, a superposition or an entangled state or the like. And I think one of my high level takeaways is at least in certain implementations of this with superconducting devices, these ideas of logical qubits, quantum error correcting codes, uh, and how you even make operations with those uh, encoded objects and implement fault tolerance in a limited way that I'll try and explain. These are all like experimentally accessible uh, topics today in, uh, in the lab. Okay. And so it's not just that like eventually we're going to scale up and do error correction. We like to say here at Yale, we're doing error correction today so that we can make robust quantum systems and eventually enable the world to scale up and make large scale systems. Okay. Uh, so to start with, error correction is a pretty interesting uh, science and technical challenge. Okay. And uh, there are several reasons for that. Uh, error correction requires quite complex uh, devices and most of the kind of best known uh, schemes for error correcting codes require rather large circuits, both in terms of number of elements and number of gates and things. And if you say, well, we'll just make really large scale quantum computers and then hopefully turn on a software layer of error correction, you might end up doing a lot of engineering before you really know what you want to build. The other big problem is that there's overhead. I'll try and explain this in more detail, but when you do uh, error correction and you redundantly encode your information, things are gonna get worse before they get better. Uh, you need, if you're going to really demonstrate an error correction gadget or some kind of stabilization, quite high performance. You need to keep all the errors low and especially have the right kinds of errors and know your errors. 
And finally, you know, if you have a large, you know, 15 qubit uh, device or something that is your prototype error correcting gadget, how do you actually know what it's doing or debug it or even figure out if it needs to be dialed a little bit more to the left to work better? Because, you know, the problem of doing state or even process tomography scales uh, exponentially. And so, in a, you know, thing with 10 or 15 qubits, you'll just never really be able to wait long enough to get a complete set of measurements to exhaustively uh, uh, characterize it. And so something we've been thinking about and working along uh, on for quite a while is uh, an idea we call hardware efficiency. Let's achieve the sort of germ of quantum error correction and of fault tolerance using the fewest moving parts as it were and trying to do as much of the error correction at sort of the hardware level in the, uh, uh, in the, in the Hamiltonian uh, domain, if you like, uh, uh, up ahead of time, okay? And so uh, the story I wanna tell you is, you know, you've maybe heard of these uh, many qubit codes like the Steen code here, uh, where you have to have, uh, uh, you know, ancillas and gates to measure the syndromes and so on and uh, show you that at least in, uh, in a partial way, we can uh, replace all of that kind of hardware with a simple uh, microwave cavity, kind of cartooned here, and maybe one ancilla device, a superconducting transmon qubit uh, or the like, and we can do sort of simplified versions of these error correction experiments today. And so the things I wanna tell you, time permitting here is, uh, you know, a little bit about uh, some experiments a couple years ago where we were able to make a error corrected quantum memory and observe that by, for the first time making measurements, we could keep a superposition uh, alive longer uh, in the face of even the naturally occurring errors um, and get to what I call break even where we're starting to at least slightly improve the lifetime of the uh, quantum information, which is of course a prerequisite for being able to do, you know, long-term error correction that really extends the life of computations and things. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit how we encode and how we do operations on these bosonic codes or these cat qubits that are placed inside these microwave resonators, and then show you a little bit of what we call fault tolerant operations on these to do a measurement of the syndrome or parity tracking, and then even to do an operation on a single encoded or error correctable qubit in a way that prevents the propagation of errors from the ancilla or the physical layer up to the logical layer, which is, I'm gonna claim, basically the, the first essence of a, of a fault tolerant uh, kind of an experiment. Um, okay, so this is the program for today. I'm gonna go a little bit more into detail about you know, reminding you how simple error correction works and uh, why fault tolerance is crucial and hard. I'll introduce bosonic uh, codes and then I'll tell you about a couple of these measurements. And we'll stop, I guess, somewhere midway through and we can take a few questions from the audience. You guys are typing them in the chat, I think is the uh, protocol. Okay. Yeah, so I just remind, because remind, I didn't do that before, that the audience should uh, please enter your questions into the Q&A chat if you're on Zoom or, or equivalently on YouTube. Right. So when you wanna build an error correcting device, uh, what are the problems you run into? So you've probably heard, well, you know, just turn on error correction and then everything gets better. Well, uh, there's a lot more to it. So this is the simplest illustration of error correction uh, that I know. Um, remember, you can't clone a state, so we can't make copies of our qubits, but we are allowed in quantum mechanics to uh, encode, let's say a superposition, a single bit of quantum information as some you know, superposition of two logical states that might be, let's say these uh, GHZ states or three qubits in the entangled state zero, zero, zero or one, one, one. So we're putting uh, a two dimensional qubit worth of Hilbert space in a much bigger, you know, eight dimensional here Hilbert space. And uh, this uh, simple code you see has a symmetry. All the qubits are supposed to be zeros or ones. Any mixture of zeros and ones between the qubits, that's not allowed and that's, going to indicate that there's some kind of an error. And there are four stabilizers here for this. Uh, we need to measure basically whether the qubits still agree or still point in the same directions. That is, uh, are things like the parity Z1, Z2 or Z1, Z3, of course, the parity Z2, Z3 is redundant. Uh, if I know those two things, I can know basically uh, either they're both plus one, which is what I intended, and then no error has occurred. Or 
let's say there's been a bit flip error on the first uh, uh, qubit in this uh, encoded logical, then I would have gone to this state, but still with the same alpha and beta. And now if I make a circuit like this, where I have two ancillas, I do these gates and I measure the result, uh, which is two classical bits of information, I will get a, a number uh, here. In this case, I would get uh, minus one and minus one for the outputs of these uh, uh, two detections. And that would tell me uh, without teaching me what alpha and beta are that the first qubit has flipped. And then I can just go ahead and flip it back. Now, this is a very simple code which has in the lingo distance three. So it's only able to correct single errors. But the idea is if I keep checking these stabilizers and uh, there's some rate uh, or probability per unit time that any one of these qubits has a, an error or a flip with probability P, I can with the measurements reduce the error to something that is uh, quadratic, so suppressing to first order the errors. So uh, now, that sounds great, but what can go wrong? Well, the first thing is we might have two errors and then when I make my measurement, I'm confused, okay? That's something which is not recoverable in this distance three code. And so if you think about what would happen in an ideal world, let's say I have a single physical qubit with a bit flip time T1. Now T1 is not actually just a bit flip, but let, you know, let me get away with that. So if I encode information in that single physical qubit and I'm forced to wait around uh, over time, I'll have an exponential decay in the fidelity of my state and my information is being corrupted by the uh, uh, interaction with the environment. So uh, now the first thing I do if I encode in that three qubit uh, space is now I have three qubits. Let's assume they're all equally good as my original qubit, but nonetheless, my information now immediately decays faster because I lose track of the superposition or the state is corrupted anytime any one of my physical qubits in the logical actually undergoes one of its errors. Now, why would we do it? Well, because again, we can to first order correct for these measurements, so, uh, sorry, for these errors. So let's say there's a time TM that it takes me to go through the entire cycle, the entire process that I had on the previous slide of measuring all the stabilizers, recording their result, and writing them down in my notebook or in my FPGA controller. Uh, then uh, there's still, if that time is finite, a probability that two errors occurred before I was done. And so I will still have errors uh, occurring, and I will still have a sort of approximately uh, exponential decay in the fidelity of my state. Uh, here I've quantized the time in units of this measurement cycle. And you know if I can do things well enough, then this probability is uh, small, and I would actually extend the lifetime of my information. And you can think about sort of the theoretical gain we could get from this kind of error correction, uh, which is basically going to be limited by you know what the bit flip time is relative to uh, the actual time it takes to measure uh, whether the error has occurred, okay? So you see, we have to be able to do these kinds of operations uh, and we have to be able to do them pretty quickly. Now, if we can do that, we can get to uh, 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 an error correction gain and we can start to see that, you know, error correction works as advertised, uh, but we need to be making these measurements quickly. But that's not the only thing that happens. This is sort of an idealized picture still. And if I now look at this code, there are other kinds of failures. So I can have these double errors, right, which give me this uh, a quadratic uh, behavior, but still a linear decrease of the information in time. I can also have, you know, this code doesn't correct for phase flip errors. So there might be other kinds of errors in my system. Uh, I can have errors in the detection of the syndrome. That would give me a, a, a mistaken inference. Maybe I can make that up on the next pass of the error correction. Maybe not. I could have things go wrong, like my ancillas are in the wrong state. I could have other kinds of couplings or errors that I induce inside the qubit or the logical qubit when I'm doing the measurements. And I could have, uh, worst of all, something where an error in the ancilla actually causes, let's say here, uh, uh, an uncorrectable error back in the logical qubit. And this sort of idea that errors can propagate forward and lead to either multiple errors or errors of a type that I can't compensate for is the problem of fault tolerance in an error correction gadget, okay? So there's this nice uh, uh, line, who watches the, the watchman? 
And in the end, you know, your error corrected uh, quantum computer is going to all be about making better ancillary that still don't pollute your top layer of delicious uh, pristine quantum information. Uh, now, it's known how to make, in principle, uh, error correction uh, systems that are fault tolerant. This is even still here, we're just talking about doing a fault tolerant detection of the errors. Again, in a conventional code like the Steen code, these are your seven qubits here that allow you to correct for both bit and phase flips. And here's one of your ancilla and uh, you can have the error propagation. The solution we're told for making things fault tolerant is to now uh, have a redundancy in our ancilla. For instance, if we have a, a four bit ancilla, which is prepared, actually needs to be fault tolerantly prepared into a cat state or a superposition state itself. And then we do gates that only entangle one of the physical ancillary with uh, individual physical qubits in the logical register, then we can guarantee that there's uh, no multiplication or uh, sort of cascading of errors. And here's the problem, right? Is uh, now we're getting wheels within wheels within wheels. The complexity is going up. And this is where uh, a lot of the sort of daunting requirements about fault tolerant thresholds in error correction come from. So let's just say I was doing this approach. I have seven uh, register qubits. I have uh, six of these errors actually in the Steam code I have to check. If I need four qubits for each of them and I have all these gates in checking the syndromes and creating and decoding uh, the ancillary, you end up with like thousands of things uh, on uh, individual physical qubits that can go wrong. And we want to like go all the way around the loop and still have probability of like 0.1 so that when I square it, it gets smaller, not bigger, right? And so that's where, you know, the threshold might even be 10 to the three, 10 to the four in one of these conventional schemes. So obviously simplifying is gonna be good. It's also going to uh, not only allow us to address these things sooner, but it's gonna in principle reduce somewhat the, the thresholds because the simpler your error correction gadget is, the more forgiving you are on the performance of the system as well. Uh, okay, maybe this is a good place to pause for some uh, questions. I guess there are many experiments that have been going on on an error correction. Here's a partial selection. I'm going to give in the next bit sort of a uh, self-centered uh, uh, view of some of the things we've done, but um, why don't we wait and see if anybody has questions about the general terminology and idea here at error correction. You did. So uh, I just have maybe to begin. Um, so in the actual hardware that you might tell us is the doing the syndrome diagnosis, the, the measuring the syndrome where the real bottleneck, or is it the more the control side of doing the gates that? Right, so in what I'll try and describe in our first error correction experiment, we could measure the syndrome, but it wasn't done fault tolerantly. And that was the thing which limited the performance right away. And since then we've figured out how to do at least in principle, maybe not yet at something that gives us more error correction gain, but that's coming, I think, uh, how to make the syndrome first order fault, sorry, the, the syndrome measurement or the stabilizer measurement uh, first order fault tolerant against these sort of problems that were limiting the performance. So indeed, like, I think what's neat about this is it got, it taught me anyway, what the essence of making a fault tolerant measurement is. It's not any different really than this, but this just feels very complicated and um, uh, not as much like physics. It's a computer science exercise for me. Right. Well, and in a related question, we have a question uh, about in this kind of scheme, there's this need for transversal gates. Uh, in, in, will you tell us in the bosonic code, do we get rid of that? Uh, yeah, the, so um, the idea there is to, is to still get, how do I want to say this? I think transversal is a particular name given to the idea that we want the spaces to divide and errors in the ancilla space not to propagate or multiply in the logical space, uh, which um, is how you do it in this sort of everything's a two level system picture. And um, 
what uh, actually uh, Liang, uh, our, our uh, uh, Liang Zhang uh, calls this is actually path independent gates. You want something where the, uh, if an error occurs, the gate or the operation or the thing you're measuring uh, gives you still some known uh, result. As long as it takes you to the right, something you can recover from, then you're okay. Which is equivalent to saying, well, this one error here, if it happens, is recoverable in the next pass in the, let's say the steam code. Very good. So I this is a this is I have a we have a kind of just a fundamental question of understanding about error correction. About do the error correct does the error correction only correct Clifford gates? So if you're running some kind of quantum simulation that requires you to do some intermediate rotation, like a uh, uh, some by some angle, um, how do you correct those mistakes? Okay, uh, that's a good question. Um, let me maybe go back to this one for a minute. Um, so uh, there's maybe two things I can try and address there. So uh, the this code allows you in principle to make any superposition of zero logical and one logical and any manipulation on it as well. And it still satisfies the properties that the stabilizers should be, you know, one of these specific combinations, depending on whether an error has occurred or not. So it, you're not restricted in the gates you can do on the logical. Now, uh, maybe the question though is asking a little bit, can I only correct a thing like a Clifford gate, which is an X gate? And the interesting thing here about error correction, you, you might say, well, what if I rotate by 10 degrees around X instead of a pie flip? Well, uh, in quantum mechanics, we should understand that as some probability that I didn't rotate or, and that I did rotate all the way by pi. And actually uh, what the act of measuring the stabilizer does is it forces the system to choose. So small errors or you know, continuous uh, evolutions that are undesirable are if you like kind of projected into happening or not happening and then they're not anymore an unknown evolution of your state. They're just nothing happened or specifically this discrete error happened. And then you can compensate for those. So it's, it's kind of you know like the projection makes the error jump and decide whether it's actually happened or not. And so in some loose sense, you know, uh, sometimes you'll say, well, it's the active error correction that makes quantum evolution in a quantum computer digital in a way. Right, excellent. Some people would not like that last statement. That's a bit too loose, but. It's, it's I, I like it. Uh, so I, we have more questions, but I think we're going to save some for the Maybe, end. Maybe, yeah. Let's see. I'm not sure how long this is going to run, so we'll try and keep it keep it moving along. So, um, yeah, I think uh, that. So there's many experiments being done here in a in a variety of different platforms. But now I'm going to specialize and tell you about uh, how we use uh, cat codes or bosonic codes and uh, and reach break even. So uh, the first sort of uh, interesting thing here is to say, well, we could inf code information in uh, a qubit, a two level system, or for doing the repetition code or the steam code or whatever in a larger Hilbert space, which is always built out of a collection mm -hmm. of two level systems. There is another alternative though, which is I can use a continuous variable system like an oscillator, and I can then have multiple states and a larger Hilbert space, and I can, also redundantly encode information in these. And the first, excuse me, of these bosonic codes is uh, known uh, as the GKP code uh, after Gottesman, Kitayev, and Preskill. And then there are other codes, including the CAT codes and uh, what we call uh, now binomial codes that basically use uh, uh, multiple uh, photons inside or could be you know, even mechanical oscillations in some uh, uh, nanomechanical device or in the motion of an atom uh, that can be used uh, to encode this information. And I'll try and describe uh, both of these a little bit. Um, and the way we do these experiments, I'm not gonna talk a lot about experimental details, but you know, we've been having a lot of fun lately with this 3D implementation of circuit QED, where we can have, uh, you know, uh, multiple uh, three-dimensional cavities, which are actually these sort of machined holes with a little post inside a block of aluminum. Uh, and uh, they can be coupled, uh, each of them, to uh, one or more of these 
uh, transmon qubits that uh, are uh, so popular in the field that allow us to do very accurate, you know, fast gates measurements, et cetera, uh, and also uh, microwave measurements to detect the state of the ancillary. And kind of, you know, in this stuff I'm gonna tell you about today, what we've been doing is we've found that it's really nice to think of kind of a flipped paradigm in circuit QED. Instead of treating the transmons, the nonlinear elements as the fundamental most interesting information carriers, they're gonna be relegated to being the ancillary, the helpers that do input output measurements, uh, et cetera. And it's going to be the cavities with their multiple levels that are going to be the Q dits more than two levels uh, or the register where we're gonna store our logical information. And there's a few reasons why we wanna do that. Uh, one is that we can make better cavities than we can qubits. We can have uh, cavities that have up to millisecond lifetimes uh, compared to maybe hundred microseconds is sort of state of the art for a, a transmon. Uh, all of these things are in the few gigahertz domain. So these cavities have now already a Q of uh, 10 to the eight or more. Um, and in addition, a really important thing is that again, we get in one cavity, multiple energy levels, but in a very efficient way, because as far as we can tell in these 3D cavities, the only thing that goes wrong is there's a finite Q. There is energy loss, which means in a harmonic oscillator, you lose photons one at a time in a very predictable way. So this is an example of correlated errors in a large Hilbert space, or it's a system which has less things that can go wrong, which means we have a simpler gadget because we only have one kind of thing we need to encode against and one uh, error we need to be monitoring for. So that's one of the key insights. Uh, now, to do all this stuff, what we rely on is uh, these tricks of circuit QED, specifically the dispersive interaction that we can get between our cavity, which is just any old oscillator, our uh, transmon qubit, which is uh, you know, a two-level system, so it's got some energy of its own, and it has, as, uh, when these things are detuned, from one another uh, by uh, an energy separation that's big compared to the sort of vacuum Rabi or the James Cummings coupling uh, between the single photon and this artificial atom, we get uh, an interaction Hamiltonian of this type, which uh, is a dispersive interaction where the frequency of the oscillator is conditioned on whether the qubit is in the ground or excited state by an amount uh, known as chi, which is this you know, sort of second order interaction. And what that means is that, uh, you know, let's say I wanna make an excitation in the oscillator. Uh, I can go from, uh, you know, uh, G to E, that's exciting the qubit, but that's going to now be conditioned on how many photons there are inside uh, this oscillator. Uh, we can have things like this. You see this photon number splitting uh, where we've achieved basically the strong dispersive limit where the second order interaction is bigger than the decay rates of the cavity or the qubit. And um, this means that we now have a way without uh, adding damping to the oscillator uh, to probe its state and to manipulate it and uh, make very complicated uh, states within uh, this oscillator that we wouldn't have been able to do without having this interaction. And of course the, the qubit or the two level system is very, very nonlinear, right? So that lets us do things you couldn't do with just a pure uh, linear oscillator with a dagger A. Uh, so um, what are examples of things we can do? Well, we can manipulate these oscillators now in ways that wouldn't really be possible otherwise. So let me go into a frame where I've, uh, I'm rotating with the qubit, I'm rotating with the cavity. So I've taken those terms out. I just have this dispersive interaction. Sorry, it's now in terms of the sigma Z rather than EE. And I add drives uh, that are sort of classical signals coming from my control system at room temperature uh, that are going to uh, push on the qubit and the cavity. And I just throw that Hamiltonian into a computer, into an optimization thing. And I say, well, I wanna do the following thing. I wanna go from vacuum in my oscillator and I wanna climb this harmonic oscillator ladder. I wanna go directly to N equals six. So shown in the bottom here is the Wigner function of this, uh, oscillator mode. Uh, here it's starting in vacuum and we're going to start with the qubit in the ground state. Uh, see, I've got some notational drift. Sorry there. GG instead of uh, sigma z being plus one. Uh, and um, we're going to play these sort of very non-intuitive uh, 
you know, in phase and quadrature drives, microwave drives that are a few megahertz of bandwidth near both the cavity and the qubit frequency, and we'll see what happens. So the computer says, do this, and you go to six. And so now I uh, can show you a movie of what like Q-tip or some Hamiltonian simulation says should happen. What you see there is that there was sort of this uh, spreading of things, right? So uh, first the oscillator and the qubit are entangled with one another. That's what this pair of Wigner functions means. But the pulse was designed such that the ancilla transmon ends up back in its ground state uh, and disentangled from the oscillator but in a very non-classical state where we have exactly six photons in the, in the uh, device. And we can measure these Wigner functions. On the left is the measured Wigner function at the end of one of those operations uh, with this nice target that shows you know, the six rings. And I can also plot for you here sort of the qubit absorption spectrum, which has a single peak at six chi, meaning, yeah, we have six quanta uh, placed in the oscillator. And so uh, this kind of capability now is pretty handy. Uh, and especially because we you know, have uh, now a way to kind of have a lot of information in these various drives, that means we can manipulate this uh, many level or uh, large dimensional Hilbert space in all sorts of interesting ways. And we can make some of these crazy states that you might want to have as your uh, encoded qubits. So the simplest version of one of these bosonic codes was not the thing we thought of first. Uh, this is in papers by uh, Steve Gervin and Liang Zhang and, uh, and, and others. Uh, you know, here's the sort of simplest idea. We need to have multiple uh, photons or multiple energy levels in our encoding so that we can recover from, let's say, single photon loss. Uh, so the idea is as follows. We're going to use two orthogonal states as our uh, zero logical and our one logical. So one logical is just n equals two. The zero logical is the even superposition of vacuum and n equals four. Now, a couple of things about this. First of all, both zero and one of the logicals have only even photon numbers in them. Second, they both have the same average photon number. These are both important. And then, uh, I can, in principle, make any superposition of these two uh, funny non-classical states like this or this, and they correspond to an X or a Y in the two-dimensional space of my uh, uh, encoded qubit. Now, why do I want to do this with even photon numbers? Well, it doesn't really matter whether it's even or odd, but it has a definite parity. And if you think about what will happen when I claim the only error that can go wrong here is a single photon loss, well, it will affect these states uh, in such a way that uh, my zero logical goes to uh, three, my one logical goes to one. Those are now odd parity. And in fact, a superposition of zero and one logical goes to the corresponding superposition of zero and one uh, in this error space. And this is sort of one of the basic criteria requirements for quantum error correction. When an error happens, it has to take you to another space. You have to be able to detect that that error has happened and it has to not manipulate the state in some unknown way. Okay? And so this is something now, which in principle you can measure the photon number parity and actually correct for things. Okay, let's see, there's a few things in the chat. I don't know if I should try to look at those. Let's just press forward. No, um, it's good. Okay, so um, now, uh, you'd say, well, all right, why do I want to encode in that crazy thing? Uh, can I even manipulate? Well, part of this uh, uh, grape or optimal control designed uh, uh, pulses, again, they give us completely arbitrary uh, control over these things. So we can even do stuff like encode in one part of the logical space and do you know the equivalent of a 90 degree rotation around X and uh, Y and anything we want here. And so we've done in previous experiments things where we built, let's say, all the Cliffords. We could also do things like the T-gate, which is a non-Clifford operation on this logically encoded thing, again, using the combination of drives on the transmon and uh, the cavity, and they work pretty well. And actually, the dominant error, this is sort of foreshadowing, is actually the decoherence of the transmon that goes with it, because it has both bit flips and phase flips uh, that can still mess you up when you're doing one of these uh, optimal control pulses. So we can encode this information. 
We can manipulate it, but now can we error correct it? Uh, and in the first error correction uh, experiment, we actually used a, a different form, but a similar idea of one of these bosonic codes. This is the so-called cat code. If you uh, think of a Schrodinger cat, which is the superposition of alpha and minus alpha, uh, that when you have uh, the symmetric superposition has also just even photon numbers. And let's say uh, the uh, symmetric cat, which is a P state rather than the superposition of two X states uh, in the other quadrature, this is an approximately orthogonal state. And I can make sort of these four component uh, cats, which will be also my uh, zero and one logical encoding. And so in this case, it's a little bit different because we're not doing four goes to three and so on. But the way this works is if I encode in, let's say, an even parity cat and I wait some amount of time, then I might have a, a photon jump. It will change. Do you see here the Wigner function, which is at zero, just the parity of the photon number, uh, changed from red to blue. Uh, that's the signal that I might have undergone a jump. And the information has been transformed in some way. Uh, if I have another jump, I go back to odd, and of course, even odd, even odd. And in this cat code, the advantage here is that you know you just need to know how many jumps have occurred, mod four, and you know what you know the state will have undergone in the presence of these of these jumps. Now you may say, where's the decoherence in the cat code picture? What happens is when there isn't a jump we become slowly more and more confident that there must never have been any photons in the cavity. And we slowly shrink uh, back toward the vacuum. And so uh, I have to either like re-encode or inflate the cats in some way. Uh, I will have a different form of loss of information. But if I start with big enough cats and in this experiment, we don't need to worry about the actual shrinking or real photon loss, just about the noisy single photon jumps, which is a little weird, but trust me, it's quantum optics. Okay. Uh, so long story short, if you didn't follow all of that, we need to correct for photon loss by measuring photon number parity. And I already told you that we have this lovely thing uh, where the transmon and scylla that we can manipulate and measure really well is coupled and can entangle with our bosonic mode. It has this dispersive interaction and it turns out that that dispersive interaction is like hardware pre-encoded as the most efficient parity measuring gadget. Uh, because it is a thing where if you like, we impart a frequency shift or a phase onto the transmon that is dependent on the photon number. So let me walk you through how this is gonna work. I'm gonna show an example here where we uh, imagine that we start with just a coherent state, which has no definite parity. And the transmon in the ground state and uh, how, Here's how we can measure the parity. We just do a simple Ramsey experiment. So if you do a pi over two pulse, the transmon ends up on the equator. So this is now the block sphere of the transmon and scylla. If we wait after that pi over two pulse, the dispersive interaction means that the frequency uh, of the qubit is uh, increasing linearly by uh, n chi for each photon. And the phase it, uh, evolves more rapidly on the equator uh, for each of those Fox states. And after a certain amount of time, uh, corresponding to pi over chi, which typically for us is a few hundred nanoseconds, you can arrange to have the following where depending on whether the state is even or odd, the transmon will be pointing along plus x or minus x. And then if you just do a pi over two pulse again at that point in time, you will actually uh, now have mapped the even states onto, let's say a flip of the transmon and the odd states onto the transmon still being in its ground state. And with this, you can make a projective measurement of the photon number parity. We did this and we used it to create by measuring the parity uh, Schrodinger cats uh, out of coherent states. Uh, but it's also a way you can measure uh, the uh, parity once you have one of these uh, bosonically encoded uh, cats. And so here's an experiment that was done a few years ago now by uh, Leon Sun and Andrei Petrenko and others in our lab, uh, where we created a coherent state and we made, you know, measurement every uh, uh, few hundred nanoseconds of the photon number parity, and we could observe uh, this kind of purple trajectory, which is the jumps of this quantum system as it relaxed back to the vacuum. Here it's in vacuum in the end, and there are no more any jumps. 
Uh, what's different about this than other quantum jump experiments is this is jumps of uh, a quantity, a, a binary valued quantity in a larger Hilbert space, or it's the real time tracking of uh, this stabilizer or this uh, error detection uh, uh, variable, which is the photon number parity. And what we could do is measure that in a time of a uh, microsecond or less with our long lived microwave cavities, the jumps occur relatively slowly. And so we could get this with pretty high measurement accuracy and with very high, what I call QND-ness. There's almost no probability that we could measure that asking the photon number parity causes a photon to be lost. So this is really like a very important thing. Now you have a way to track in a measurement time that's much shorter than the typical time between errors when an error may have occurred. So now to put this all together, what we did is uh, the following. And if you recall back to my description of some of the challenges of error correction, one of the things is it might usually not be possible to actually watch the error correction gadget as it goes. In this hardware efficient scheme, we could actually sort according to error trajectories and do full tomography of both the uh, logical qubit and all the ancillae uh, uh, and see, you know, sort of shot by shot what happens. Uh, I call this the debugger view. This is actually, you know, measuring uh, everything that happens. So here we encode uh, some superposition with an even parity. We can make a measurement. We can take a snapshot of this. We can say, oh, the controller has decided that there has been an error. If we pause the uh, uh, operation of the routine there and we look, indeed, you find the opposite color. So the parity has switched from even to odd. Uh, if the controller says there's no error, indeed, it looks like there's still even parity. And here I'm just showing two steps, but we could do dozens and dozens of passes of the error correction. And what's really cool here is you see that, you know, things aren't perfect, but even in the case where the controller thinks there's an error, there's a clearly co there's coherence, there's a state here which has actually been manipulated or uh, it's not the right term. It's been corrupted or transformed by the interaction with the environment and the loss of the photon. But once we know that it's done that, it's actually still in a known state and the superposition is recoverable. And so we could actually do you know, process tomography on storing a bit of information and looking at it back here keeping all the shots, all the runs, and looking at all of the uh, possibilities. And then we could uh, you know, see how we did. And so here it is. So we could do things like store the bit of information in the transmon and it decays quickly. Uh, the thing we want to compare against is storing a bit of information in the minimal way in our best physical component in the system, which is a zero or a one uh, photon in the longest lived box, which is the cavity. So that's this number here which was 290 microseconds. When we encode in, in fact, it turns out about n equals three photons, the lifetime here gets shorter. Remember, this is the penalty for error correction or the overhead I described. Uh, so things get worse. Uh, but when we now uh, do the measurements and we use that information, you see that we do a little bit better. There's more coherence. There's more quantum information remaining. And in fact, the lifetime is just slightly better than uh, the lifetime if you didn't do any error correction. If you encode, but don't do the error correction, it's much worse. When you apply the error correction, you're gaining. So you're actually gaining almost a factor of two and a half or three here, but you're not getting back to where you wanted to be, right? So uh, that's reaching break even in error correction. And I think this is, it's only in the bosonic systems, uh, as far as I'm aware that this has been achieved yet. Uh, now, you know, we could play some games and cheat too if we, wanted to you know, say, well, we only can afford to post-select if we keep you know, uh, the top 80% of things which we have confidence in, in our measurement records, we can even extend the lifetime a little longer. So don't take this necessarily as meaning there's no hope for error correction in the near term. There are ways around this. We always try and be uh, careful and compare ourselves against the most stringent bound or you know, whether we could really make a long-term uh, uh, long scalable system out of these. How are we doing on time? We're OK. Um, so uh, now the other thing that's kind of nice in this gadget is we understood why it only got to uh, uh, this gain of about three or reaching break even. Uh, and 
we could also kind of map, even though it's a very different scheme with these pi over two pulses and the trans one measuring the parity, we could sort of map uh, a lot of the processes that limited the performance onto this, you know, general types of failures in a regular uh, error correcting code that I mentioned before. So again, we can measure hundreds of times faster than the errors occur. So if that was the only thing that this is a first order code uh, or distance three code, uh, we would have expected a lifetime gain of like two orders of magnitude. Now there are other things that go wrong. Uh, there was some finite rate of cavity heating, which we can't tell apart. There's uh, the errors of phase flips in the transmon, which corrupt the information you get, but don't mess up the state. Uh, there are things like how well we could prepare the state of the uh, ancilla transmon. There are things like a Kerr interaction, which also corrupts the inner uh, information uh, that, that comes in due to the coupling to the transmon. But in the end, the real thing that limited us was the energy relaxation of the transmon. And in fact, you might have noticed in the previous slide here, we actually only measure like every 30 microseconds. It's, it's like 30 times slower than the fastest we could have measured. Because in fact, the real limitation here is if we measure too rapidly, the errors we're injecting from the non-fault tolerance of the measurement would have corrupted the information even faster. And so in the end, we got like this overall factor of two, which, uh, or two to three, which is, you know, what we expected. So, you know, kind of, it's nice when the thing works the way you think it should. And it points to what we need to do, which is we need to suppress this mechanism, uh, which is the analog of forward propagation or non-fault tolerance. And let's see, that's the thing I wanna try and explain in the last, few minutes here of the talk. Uh, we pause here and see if there are any questions. Why don't we just push on because I think uh, we won't get yeah. to the end and then we'll. So let me just show how this uh, uh, affects you. Uh, this is a kind of a cartoon of this Ramsey experiment to measure the parity. Um, and the thing that can happen here is if the transmon undergoes an energy relaxation event, then basically, again, the cavity frequency shifts abruptly and it introduces uh, this kind of scrambling of the Wigner functions. So if there's a relaxation of the transmon anytime during the parity measurement, then I introduce a kind of dephasing which will completely scramble my cat. And that's an error which is not correctable. It's not of the type that our code is designed for and that's a big problem, right? And so this is uh, why I say it's kind of non-fault tolerance. Now, I probably won't have time to go into all the details but again, we know how to make it fault tolerant in the qubit picture. It's by making stuff a lot more complicated. And the question here is, can we do this in our kind of physics uh, uh, Hamiltonian engineering way uh, that is more efficient and doesn't introduce nearly as much complexity? And the answer is yes. So here's the thing. We're entangling, that's what this little figure eight is supposed to show, our transmon with the cavity state during the measurement. And it's using this fact that the cavity frequency and the qubit frequency are conditioned one on the other by this amount chi. So here's how we can make the parity measurement first order fault tolerant against qubit relaxation. We need to introduce a larger Hilbert space for our ancilla or our measurement. But we only need to add one more energy level. This is similar to what uh, 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 the theorists now tell us about bosonic codes. You can add in principle one more energy level in your oscillator and correct one additional error if you know what it is. Uh, so we're going to use not the superpositions of G and the first excited state of the transmon, but the second excited state of the transmon. It's again, going beyond the two level system or pure qubit picture of quantum information. And that uh, uh, pair of states, if I entangle them uh, with the cavity, and I have a dispersive interaction can do the same kind of Ramsey detection and tell me whether the parity is even or odd. And if I can arrange, which is not natural in the transmon, that the dispersive shift to the cavity in the F state and in the E state are the same, they're both plus chi and both different than the ground state, then I can have a very special thing where if the, transmon during the parity measurement is in this excited state and it's 50-50 and it falls to the E state, we have one energy relaxation event in our ancilla, then uh, still the cavity frequency is unchanged. 
And that means that I won't introduce an error, but it requires this sort of interchangeability of the E and the F states from the point of view of the cavity. And the way we do this is like an atomic physics trick. We use actually the fact that there are H levels in the E, F, G, H uh, in the uh, transmon, and we put a bunch of lasers on, no, they're microwave drives, and we dress these E and F states in just the right way to build uh, a tunable dispersive coupling. And we can have a particular point in the power and uh, detuning of these uh, drives that should give us, uh, let's say here, a matching of the dispersive shift on the G and the E state. Let's do that first. Then uh, the T2 of our cavity, which was ordinarily limited by the heating of the transmon, sort of the reverse thing, if it jumps up, it changes the frequency. We can see that we can sort of turn off the dispersive interaction and enhance the def dephasing time of the cavity. We can sort of make it transparent in the sense that errors in the transmon now don't affect the oscillator. And that is matching the GE levels. Uh, we could do this in such a way where we turn on and off with the RF to match the chi's in G and E or match the chi's in G and F and use superpositions of G and F to do this Ramsey mapping and uh, Ramsey experiment and map the parity. And we could detect uh, the parity with decent fidelity, not quite as good. This is a more complicated thing uh, than in the regular uh, transmon experiments. And we could look at sort of how the cavity state evolves as we make these measurements. And here we're not actually yet doing all the error correction and extending lifetime, but we can show that our measurement is less perturbing on uh, the cat code or on our uh, cavity and its encoding. And what uh, we're quoting here is sort of a, a dimensionless number, which is like we can measure five times uh, as often uh, before we on average introduce an error. So this is like a kind of a gain, which is slightly more than one. I mean, you would want this fault tolerance gain to be really, really big uh, and, and the like, but this is a way that we can now prevent these kind of errors from propagating up into the uh, transmon. So let's see, we, uh, you guys tell me, should we uh, do one more thing here, which is uh, being able to drive a gate or should we sort of try and wrap up here and give them a few minutes to ask questions? Uh, I think I see some nods in the panel. And we started a little late, so we'll okay. just a few more minutes. Okay, so uh, again, I understand that probably now we're, I'm just gonna skate over the top of this. And there's a lot, as you can see, even with this hardware efficient, simple system, there's a lot of complexity in the manipulations and things we wanna do. But uh, the most recent experiment, we were able to do a manipulation a gate on that uh, cat encoding or uh, binomial encoding in a way where we can detect and suppress the errors due to the transmon. Remember I said in our fancy optimal control pulses that allow us to do very uh, complex arbitrary manipulations on the cavity. Uh, the problem is that you're entangled with the transmon and it's T1 and T2 or bit and phase flips uh, can, can hurt you. So uh, for example, a thing we can do that's a little simpler than the OCT or grape optimal uh, control things is just uh, an operation like this, which is um, a sort of uh, type of procession or uh, uh, Robbie flopping in the logical space of this uh, zero plus uh, four uh, two space. And we do that by basically imparting with the uh, transmon a kind of geometric phase, that's what's being shown here, by doing uh, uh, manipulations where you go from the ground state to the excited state and back uh, for the transmon. That allows us to put a phase on a particular number state. And by driving those in parallel, we can do complex manipulations. It's not a full universal control here, but it's one axis of manipulation on the blocks here. And to make it uh, insensitive to transmon errors, we followed a proposal by Liang Zhang, who's now moved to Chicago, and one of his postdocs, Wen Long Ma, uh, to make it fault tolerant, or what we also sometimes call uh, uh, an error transparent gate, so or path independent gate, excuse me. Um, so again, we're going to use the G, E, and F levels. So it's again fruit of this same tree. Uh, we're going to there's the dispersive shift. So there's a unique transition to go from G to F, depending on whether there's zero, two, or four photons in the cavity. 
And we'll do a kind of two photon Raman thing here to go virtually because you need that for the selection rules. And we'll be able to drive those things uh, separately. And we're gonna do the same trick uh, at the same time where we match the chi's of F and E. And now if you think about it, there's a very interesting thing. Again, this is sort of showing the informatic uh, optimization or something. Uh, we wanna do the gate on the cavity. There are three things we need to know. Did it work? Did the transmon have a phase flip error or did the transmon have a bit flip error or relaxation error? And now we wanna start in the ground state and uh, we're gonna to go to the F state. And if we're successful, then there's been no error. And this sort of operation will occur in the cavity. If there's a relaxation event, we'll fall from F to E. And at the end, if we detect that we're in the E state of the transmon, then uh, we'll know that a decay happened, but it turns out the gate is successful, plus there's some small deterministic rotation we can make up for. And in addition, there might've been a dephasing event. It turns out that if you have dephasing, you wind up back in the ground state, that's fine. It also turns out, this is kind of amazing when we, when we wrote it down, uh, that you've done nothing to the cavity. It's a different gate, but it's a known unitary you've imparted on the gate. And if we want to then make it a deterministic gate, we just say, if you measure G, repeat until success. And so we're gonna do this manipulation. We're gonna rotate in the encoded space of the qubit, of the logical qubit. We're gonna detect after each gate, the state of the transmon. And we're gonna do randomized benchmarking on that. Interleaved randomized benchmarking with other Cliffords on the logical qubit in between. And uh, if we have a failure, we're gonna repeat until success. So it's a non-deterministic thing where each gate has a measurement in between. It's really like doing a smallest version of a quantum error corrected algorithm of a type. Uh, and um, we see that we have some infidelity of the gate. It's a much more complicated gate. It's not the best gate. That's the overhead again, dang, right? But when we turn on this uh, fault tolerance and make the use of the information, we actually improve the fidelity of the gate. And again, I call it fault tolerant here in a sense because we're preventing our pristine error correctable qubit from getting affected by the ancilla. Now, again, in this, we didn't do the whole kit and caboodle. We didn't actually monitor in between each gate for photon loss and do the other experiment to correct for the photon loss. But in principle, we could have. And so if we ignore photon loss, uh, or if we had done that correction perfectly, uh, we would have gained maybe even a factor of three. And maybe my final thing I wanna show you is just that, um, you know, the other thing we could do here is uh, actually add in known amounts of additional relaxation or dephasing, you know, bit flips and phase flips on our ancilla and show that, you know, when we add relaxation, we detect the relaxation. When we add dephasing, we detect the dephasing. And then we could look at how the ordinary gate deteriorates as you have more errors in the ancilla. And we could look at when we implied the information uh, or did the whole fault tolerant and monitoring thing. And you actually you know, are, are making yourself literally you know, much less susceptible to these errors. So you know, this is really kind of the goal of this thing. This is a bit like showing your error correction code suppresses the errors when you look. This is the Fault tolerant operation is suppressing the propagation of the errors uh, when you add uh, those errors in. So, okay, uh, it's a pretty complicated thing. We also think we know what limits its performance and there's work to do. <laughs> Let's stick with that. Um, there's also lots of other really cool uh, experiments now uh, going on, not just in our group uh, on uh, bosonic error correction. So uh, uh, the group in, in uh, Tsinghua has done this uh, sort of real-time error correction on the binomial code. We did the cat code. Uh, there uh, are ways we've recently used uh, uh, these binomial codes to send a signal between two separate modules uh, inside a fridge that we could make first order insensitive to uh, the photon loss along the transmission path um, and actually reach break even for, error, uh, for remote entanglement. And then there are neat things with other kinds of bosonic codes, including these GKP and hexagonal GKPs, uh, which have been done with ions in the Jonathan Home group. And the full error correction with the GKP reaching 
break even was done by my colleague Michelle Deveray and is in this uh, recent paper that will uh, be coming out soon. So there, I think I'll wrap up here and uh, uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity and for listening. Um, maybe I'll just point out uh, some of the people. So uh, Stefan, uh, Liang and Wen Long are the theory team that uh, did a lot of work on um, uh, you know, how we manipulate these cats and uh, the uh, error transparent uh, or path uh, independent gates. Uh, Rainier and Phil did a lot of the original cat manipulation and Serge, who's now a, um, a faculty at Weizmann, uh, 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 you know, participated also in these uh, fault tolerant experiments and the gates. And as always, I want to thank all my uh, collaborators and colleagues uh, at Yale for, for all of their help over the years. So I think with that, let's just go to the final slide. And thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Rob. Really exciting stuff. Uh, we have a number of questions here, so I'll get started here. Um, we have a question from Mark Stone says, when the ground state is dressed with excited state population to match chi, does this introduce loss into the ground state? And is the scheme robust against such loss? Okay, that's a good question. So um, let me uh, try and pull up a picture too that might help. Let's see here. Uh, Maybe that's a bit of a bridge too far. Let's see, we'll try. So this shows a little bit more of the energy level scheme of how we do things. And um, it requires actually the four levels of the transmon. And what we do is we try to drive off resonantly uh, from E to H. And uh, that allows us to sort of push around basically the uh, photon number dependent uh, states of the um, transmon to get this kind of chi matching. So uh, in principle, we shouldn't have needed to degrade anything, but in fact, uh, there are two things that go wrong. So first of all, um, it's not just relaxation of the transmon, but there is in everybody's superconducting qubits, an unknown reason why they sometimes heat up even though we're at uh, a temperature much, much less than H bar omega. Um, so sometimes they just heat and like, if we're here, we can just heat from E to F and that's something which confuses us and is a failure mode. The other thing that uh, we're doing here is we have to drive off resonantly to this H state, which also has its own dephasing and relaxation. And so indeed we uh, do introduce a little bit of additional photon loss in the cavity due to this driving or dressing process which in principle isn't terrible, because again, that's a thing you're already saying you want to correct for, um, but, uh, and it, it does introduce though some, also some additional heating of the transmon. So yeah, no Hamiltonian is perfect, and these tricks have a cost associated with them. Very good. All right, we have a question from Monica Shiloh Smith who asks, what sets the optimal cat size to use in the cat code? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you could perform the parity measurement faster, would you win anything by having a larger cat? Or does it just need to be large enough to make the logical qubits near orthogonal? And how much, how close you have to be near orthogonal? Right, right. Yeah, so uh, <coughs> it's a good question. I mean, uh, we found in this experiment that there was kind of an optimum actually at about sort of n bar equals three. Uh, of the cat. Um, and uh, the reason for that is if you make the cat bigger, uh, your states get more and more orthogonal, right? And, uh, and so the code is better. But of course, uh, you're having a bigger overhead. <laughs> uh, or, you know, the first photon loss, of course, is happening at n bar kappa, uh, a faster and faster rate. Um, and so what we kind of did for this uh, optimum was, you know, we said, well, we want to be able to track it for a little while, it's gonna shrink and we lose some uh, information from the overlap of the coherent states, but let's just keep that small enough and trade that against the photon loss. Um, so I don't know that a bigger cat is really that much more desirable. You win like very rapidly exponentially in distance in the cat. You can sort of think of that as like the distance in regular codes. Um, so, uh, it's a good question. And, and actually, I think what we've also really learned over the last few years is that the GKPs are even better than the cats. They're more efficient. 
Um, it's just even more complicated to make them and manipulate them and stuff, but we're getting there. All right. Adam Kaufman asked, how small scalable can the 3D cavities be? Yeah, uh, yeah. Your yeah. prospect for tinier oscillators and with similar photon lifetimes? There, there, there is. Um, you know, we've been investigating both the decoherence in these devices and better ways to make them for a long time. <laughs> um, and, you know, uh, the picture evolves, but, you know, at the present, we actually don't even re really know what limits the lifetime of these things. And it should be, maybe this is also an important thing to say, like these 3D cavities and also the transmons, like their lifetime should be a million years at these temperatures. Really. Uh, so um, we have made, for example, uh, microwave cavities either out of strip lines or out of three dimensional structures that are made by etching into wafers, coating and bonding. They're a little bit more compact as a cavity um, and they're more sensitive to materials imperfections and things, but we've been able to get cues up to like 300 million in those or lifetimes of maybe five milliseconds. That's the work of Chen Yu Lei, uh, one of the postdocs in my group and, uh, and the, the team. Um, uh, we also have other ways of maybe miniaturizing these things and making them more manufacturable that maybe you'll hear about in another few months or a year. Uh, the size though, isn't a problem. Uh, the size of a quantum system like this or the difficulty in making a larger, more complicated one is not about the volume. In the fridges in our labs, we can have a cubic meter of payload. This thing looks big, but it's sort of this size. Uh, and actually the reason it's this big is to get all the connectors and access ports on it. So I don't know if you've seen even the chip based ones. Sometimes people show you the chip with lots and lots of stuff, but of course it's the fan out of getting all the wires in and out. That's really the expensive bulky thing that takes up all the dang space in the dill fridge. So um, we have a position paper sort of, or a concept paper about this saying, like, it's just fine to build a 3D thing. The, the cavities themselves are about a CC at our frequency. So you can fit a million of them in a cubic meter payload of a single fridge, but it's not gonna take a million of them. It'll be not that hard, still hard, not that hard. I think just a few more questions here. John Simon asks, uh, are, are there known fundamental bounds on error correction lifetime enhancement that's set by the transmon's cavity cooperativity or the transmon anharmonicity? Um, so yeah, so a thing we have to worry about here in this kind of system actually, uh, uh, because um, the 3D cavities are so long, long lived, uh, you know the Purcell effect, which is uh, an atom can be uh, limited in its lifetime, not intrinsically, but by like the fact that it's coupled to some continuum or to a cavity mode that can decay. We talk about the reverse Purcell effect, which is that there is some hybridization, even though you're in the dispersive limit between the cavities and the qubit. And so the cavity acquires a little dissipation from the Josephson junction or the chip. Uh, but by making that detuning a gigahertz or so, we can basically suppress that mechanism, but there is a fundamental limit there. So, you know, a thing going forward is we'd want better T1. Actually, we don't really need better T2 in our transmons. That's something which is pretty easy to error correct away, but better T1 in our transmons, we could either couple more strongly or we could employ a really long lived cavity. Um, so, I mean, there are sort of limits, but I don't think I know of a fundamental limit. And again, like the cat code and so on are first order codes, but in principle, you can get a lot of gain even from your first layer of error correction, as long as you can measure much faster uh, and have the probability of an error be small enough. Um, so we'll just have to see. Okay, we have a few more just very fun questions. Though. So Bill Phillips asked, says, this is one of my favorite, I always talk about this in class, doing a measurement of photon parity in the cavity sounds a lot like what a Roshan company did with Fabry-Pro microwave cavities and Rydberg atoms as probe. Is there a difference? And if so? Uh, no, I mean, in fact, uh, I didn't point it out, but here's the reference. So this was Patrice Bertin. 
Bay yeah. in, in the search yeah. group uh, was doing I, I, this I love, thing. I so, I mean, I think uh, the, yeah, I mean, this is really beautiful. And, uh, um, you know, I think uh, basically it's Rydberg Adams and Circuit QED are the only ones I think that are really been in the strong dispersive limit that allows these kinds of things. So it is very much that same spirit and same idea. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, um, I think just, you know, things they can't do are like park the Rydberg atom in the cavity for just the right amount of time and do stuff like these optimal control pulses to make those kind of crazy states um, and so on. So, but the physics is very much the same. Uh, everyone in my group has a copy of exploring the quantum on their desk. So, Chris, did you ask, um, you, is, if we talk about bosonic error, uh, correction codes, is there such thing as fermionic error correction codes? Uh, uh, so um, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I guess um, the, the, I mean, an interesting thing, right, is that even qubits uh, in regular quantum computers are not uh, actually fermions, they're just two level systems. Um, so I think, yeah, maybe, maybe qubit code versus bosonic is not the ideal terminology, although I think it's kind of set now. Um, it's really two level versus N level uh, codes or something like that. But I guess the thing we've really been finding is that having a multi-level system, even if it's basically just a harmonic oscillator ladder, is actually a pretty handy thing if you have these other capabilities and knobs at your disposal. All right. Now, it's always been the tradition of models that Bill Phillips asked the first question, but I'm just flipping his head, and he's going to ask the last question mm -hmm. of the year. We miss his green laser pointer on my slide. All right. Yeah. Well, so here's the question. Given all that you have learned, what are the chances of having an immortal qubit in my lifetime and then parenthetically in yours? <laughs> Oh gosh. Uh, well, I hope we are both here. I think it's for sure. And, you know, I, I mean, maybe also the point is we'll never have an immortal qubit, uh, right? I mean, it, it, as long as you have any finite level of error correction, uh, uh, you know, you're always going to have some probability of loss and, and leakage. But seeing that there's real gain here, and I think also seeing that we have computations we can run where at least some of the parts have some forms of error correction and it yields some actual computational benefit. I think that's coming before too long. Excellent. All right, well, on that happy note, let's uh, thank Rob again. Thanks a lot. It's and, a pleasure. Uh, we have uh, someone maybe in the chat box or someone put the, uh... all right. So uh, we have the post seminar discussion room. Uh, we encourage particularly students and postdocs to join us and anyone else who wants to be there.